What we've been doing is we've been looking at questions with the target goal being that our discernment would be refined. My wife asked me earlier, what questions are you answering tonight? And I told her about the first one and she said, well, what does that have to do with a bunch of young people? And I said, discernment. And, and so that's, that's been the goal here is to look at the questions that are coming in and then we kind of challenge ourselves to think scripturally about how we should seek to answer these things. Now, kind of like last week, you remember Ken said something like, are you, what did he say? Are you, are you, yeah, is this a trick question? So yes, he asked, is it a trick question? And it was a question that had to do with a woman from Hungary and she had been in a three-year relationship with a guy living with him and she got saved and now she was asking about the relationship and then I brought other factors in that sometimes pastorally we have to consider about pre-existing relationships and whether you have children and sometimes the answer isn't always so easy. And so you, you understand when these questions come. You're, th you're thinking about various things. You're thinking about the good of the individual. You think about the good of the church if the person writing to you is involved with the church. You think about the good of the person's family. Like, like I'll give you another example. Let's, let's say, I've had this happen. I had elders, an elder from another church call me and say, we have a man in our church. He ended up in a room with a professing Christian woman from another church. They didn't do anything, but they were ready to. And the man's wife called, and as soon as that happened, the man ran out of there. The man went, confessed it to his elders. One of the elders called me and said, do you think that this man needs to confess this to his wife because obviously it's going to be devastating to her even though nothing happened he was all set for something to happen and uh, <clears throat> you know you might look at well we can look at these situations and uh, you know sometimes you're asking well, how, is, how is this going to affect the family I, my answer to this elder was, oh, you, you better believe you, you need to tell her because you have a woman from another church who knows what happened. And I said, if, if it, it ever came out that this happened and it was found out that all the elders knew and they, they basically covered this thing over, that it, it would not just be bad you know, it's kind of like you want to think about if a woman were to find out her husband was unfaithful, that's one thing. If a woman finds out through the grapevine that her husband was unfaithful, not from him, that's another thing. If a woman finds out through the grapevine that her husband was unfaithful and the elders of the church knew about it, See, that's an, even, that's an even other thing. You know some of the situations that have happened in some of the churches where there, there was some kind of indiscretion with members in the church and with children and where elders covered those over. I don't know if you know, but I mean some big names and some reform circles went down because of situations like that. Now, th there was another situation John Seitzman and I were facing. A man had committed adultery before he became a Christian 
His wife was unconverted and he told us, if I tell her, she will divorce me. And we knew her and we knew he was probably right. And we told her not to, we told him not to tell her. And, and in that case, you see that the, the goal is we were seeking to protect the marriage and we believe that that was the best way and John and I both agreed that that, that was the best way. See, what, what we're dealing with here is we're, it, it's, the, the goal here has been this. From way back, I was dealing with this kind of Christianity that is just a checklist. Right and wrong, do's and don'ts, you know, give me the list. But it's not like that. Life isn't like that. And, and in fact, I'm, I've, I've really been studying, uh, I've, I've really been contemplating Luke 6 and just how our Lord, it's like the showbread. Nobody can eat it but the priest. Check that. Oh, but a hungry man comes in with, with some troops with him and then it's okay. They're guiltless. They broke the law, but they're guiltless. You see the principles that the Lord wants us to think about. Now, I say all that just kind of leading into this. You all might say when, when I bring this out, are you, are you kidding us? I mean, but here's the thing that I want you to think about. I want you to think about the man, potential family, the church, and I want you running this through the lens of Scripture. And, and I, 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 let's wrestle with this together. Maybe it doesn't take, maybe this one doesn't take that much wrestling, but let's just handle it. I'm a young associate pastor, and he writes anonymously. I'm a young associate pastor, so he's young, He's not the primary pastor. He's an associate pastor in Tennessee. I really need some advice. I'm struggling praying and studying the Word like I once was. Or I'm struggling praying and studying the Word like I used to. I think that's what he's saying there. I have fallen <clears throat> into all kinds of sexual sin with the opposite sex. And I feel like I can't stop. I'm really struggling. I've been drinking a lot lately. I really feel like I should leave the pastorate for a long time. Please give me some extremely sound advice. Now, what I, one of the things that I've been emphasizing is this. You want to analyze the, the question. Sometimes the questions are not, they're not valid. They're not legitimate. They don't, sometimes people have presuppositions that are wrong. Um, sometimes, sometimes people say things when the reality is they're, they're putting a People love to put protective spins on things. Even a guy that's admitting things like this, and even a guy that admits things like this anonymously, there is still such a root of self-protectiveness in mankind that he says, I'm struggling. I don't, I don't, I hear that a lot. I'm struggling with this sin. And you listen it's like, uh, no, you're not. You're not, you're not struggling. You're, you're diving in. I, I, I mean, it's not like you're, it, it's not like you're the, the lamb who is, you, you know, inadvertently fell into the mud and is trying like crazy to get out. This, this is the pig that's going in the mud on purpose over and over and over again. There's not a struggle here. I mean, and, and maybe somebody would say, well, you know, doesn't, aren't you being kind of hard on the guy? 
Um, I really need some advice. I'm str this is how he starts. I'm struggling praying and studying the word like I once did. Well, I don't think any of us would be surprised at that. Studying the Word and, and gleaning from it profitably, praying and having profitable communion with the Lord. You just think about 1 John 1 and walking in the light as He is in the light. And that it is there that we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And we, we would expect, of course, that a prayer life would fail and the word would fail. And this is, this is the one that when I was mentioning, my wife says, you know, what does that have to do with young people? Well, it's, it's us looking at this and saying, what do you, what do you tell the guy? It's, it's us applying scripture and being discerning. I mean, what do you, what do you say I mean, you come, you know, imagine yourself coming like the Lord came to the rich young ruler. The guy in the end rejected Christ, and Mark tells us he loved him. And you know, you come to people, and you could just be disgusted by this guy. You could say, seriously? I, I mean, you're, you're in the ministry. You're a drunk, you're a fornicator, and you're wondering what, I mean, seriously? But if you love this, you love him and you want to help him, I mean, what do you say to him? first thing that would seem to evidence any repentance in his life is if he goes to the other leaders in the church, confesses his sin, and steps down because he's not meeting the qualifications of an elder. He's a drunkard, like you said. And he needs to do that. I don't know if that's the first thing he needs to do, but if he's really wanting to follow Christ, he'd be willing to get in the light and not try to cover this up. Yeah. I remember um, James' father-in-law. I, I often would go to Bob for counsel on various things, and Bob's counsel was, "Bring it in the light. Bring it in the light." That's he. He felt like you got any kind of situation, you just bring it all in the light. That's the safest thing. Get it out in the open, and. Uh, you know, and I like you heard me just talk about John Seitzman and I dealing with one situation where we didn't bring everything into the light. And but I but I think Bob's counsel, um, you know, ninety eight percent of the time, if I, I think I think in in some calculated situations where perhaps bringing something into the light. Um, would create more devastation than it would than it would help. Like you know, a guy and a girl are getting married, and and you come from not so pristine pasts. You certainly don't need to say everything and tell everything and dump all the garbage out on the table. That that isn't. You want to communicate things that are necessary to communicate, but you, there are things that are not, in some cases, necessary. But I mean, where you have, where you have situations where, um, like, like I say, in, in, in most situations, getting it out in the light. And see, he's anonymously reaching out through the internet. He really does, like James says, he needs to take this before whatever the leadership structure is. I mean, he's an associate pastor. Maybe, that there, maybe there's one primary pastor. Whatever that leadership structure looks like. But he needs, 
he needs to go and he need, that, that would be the fir very first thing. There's no indication here. I mean, it sounds like he's young and single and yes, he needs to he needs to confess it to the leadership. That would if there was any serious uh, if there was any uh, legitimacy to his repentance, that's where it would need to start. Anybody think of anything else that you would say or do? I mean, you know, one of, one of the things that it sounds to me like is he's talking about leaving the pastor for a long time. Um, you know, we're not only dealing with qualifications for eldership here. We're we're dealing with we're dealing with the marks of true Christianity when when you're dealing with this kind of situation, and and you actually have you actually have somebody that that very likely falls into a category of First Corinthians five, a, a man that very likely should be excommunicated immediately. Now. Look, if we were in the leadership and one of the elders came into the elders meeting and, I mean, in humble contriteness, confessed disqualifying sins, you, you probably wouldn't react like 1 Corinthians 5 simply... Again, it's, it's not always clear cut. You have, to, you have to weigh out all the factors. You have to weigh out the implications to family, the implications to the individual, the implications to the church. We have had situations where people have come to the elders confessing sin in broke, seemingly broken fashion, but their sin has been so repeated in nature that we felt like we needed to excommunicate. Even though at the time they're confessing it, but, it's, but, but there's some aggravated issue in, in the situation that we felt like for the sake of the church it was necessary. There's been other times when things have been confessed to the elders and nobody ever knew. It seemed like it was a... a, a it, it was a first-time thing. They came to the elders. It wasn't discovered. They seemed to be broken and confessed the matter. But there's, there's, you, you have to pray. You have to wrestle through these things, and you have to, you have to examine the different passages of Scripture. I would say that if somebody in the church discovered this to be true about this guy before he had confessed anything, that probably excommunication would be in order. And excommunication is not the end of the line. It's not like if he is repentant and the repentance is genuine that he can't be restored. Not to the ministry. And I would say very likely never again to the ministry. And again, that, that might even bring up another another question, you know, if a guy does this and it seems like he's repentant and it seems like he's a genuine Christian, is there a place in the ministry for him again in the future? Well, I think the, the question is, is simple. Answering it's not so easy, but the question is simple. Does he meet the qualifications of, of you know, many of them are in First Timothy and in Titus. In fact, and, I, and I'm talking about the whole, the whole of those books, not just the two isolated chapters. There are other qualifications that are given throughout there, and you can go other places. First Peter would be a good place. Acts would be a good place. There's other places where the qualifications are, are seen. And, and that's really the question. The question isn't, well, can somebody who's fallen into sin be put back in the ministry at some point, or if they've never been in the ministry, can they be put in the ministry sometime in the future if they committed certain sins while they were a Christian? Well, the real issue is that has to be answered is, do they meet the qualifications? And the qualification for the ministry is blamelessness. And so that's the question that the church has to ask 
is does an individual meet that qualification? Because as, as has often been emphasized and needs to be emphasized, there is a must in 1 Timothy 3. You must meet those qualifications. Those, those are not negotiable. Those are not optional. Any other thoughts, James? You know, we have a lady called the church phone today. She's in San Antonio. And she ran across the church website. And she was wanting counsel because the pastor of the church <coughs> had committed adultery. And it got confessed just to the leadership team. And they voted to let him start preaching again in 30 days. And they're not going to tell the entire congregation. So the whole congregation does not know he committed adultery. And in 30 days, he's going to be preaching again. But she knows. How'd she find out? Because her husband's in the leadership. Oh. And so they had a meeting, and that's where it was confessed. <clears throat> but even there, it, was just, it just showed there's no fear of God, no fear of His Word, no sense of what does it mean to be in the leadership. And it's just sad to know that that stuff is being tolerated all over the place. It is. And, and what we want to think about is not what most of the mainline churches are willing to accept. We need to look at Scripture. Look, Judgment Day for the lost is going to be bad. Judgment Day for those who took it upon themselves to go into the ministry when they weren't called is bad. If you're lost, it's real bad. And if you're saved, 1 Corinthians 3 says it's still bad. It's, it's, it's <clears throat> because what it is, it's largely a wasted life. What you see in 1 Corinthians 3 is men being saved so as by fire. And what you see is their ministry basically being burned up, wood, hay, and stubble. And that's what you'll end up with if God hasn't called you to the ministry. And I'm not just saying whether your ministry is biblical. I'm saying being a man who God has actually equipped to handle His Word. There can be Christians who carry their Bibles around under their arms, but God really hasn't called them to be in that place. Any, anybody have any other thoughts on that?